Let's. Can you hear me? Yes, that works. Good. As I had a very nice introduction from Ligi, very happy about this, very happy to be here. Has been a long week. We had SafeCon at the beginning, or last weekend, it was awesome. And then DevCon and now Protocol Berg as a final of this week. Um, yes, I want to talk a little bit about how to unleash the power of account abstraction, or to be a little bit more specific, what are the building blocks that we are currently, or what the ecosystem is currently working on for modular smart contract account, and why are modular smart contract accounts the power of account abstraction? And what I want to say at the beginning, like this talk is meant to create awareness. I'm going to present quite some ERCs. All of these ERCs are in draft state. There is active discussion going on on Ethereum magicians. And um, after having such a nice week with all these conferences where a lot of discussion was happening, I want that this discussion continues on Ethereum magicians that we can collaborate better and create standards that are used in the long run also by the whole account abstraction ecosystem. A little bit disclaimer, I'm going to, like the ESC that I present, I have to simplify them to some extent, right? Like they are, some of them are quite complex, a lot of details, so I encourage you to read them up later on on the EIP's web page, but I try my best to give a high level overview and I'm going to start out with, um, with account abstraction, going to give some high level introduction to account abstraction and what are the standards there or what is the main standard there that we all know of. Then go a little bit into modular smart contract accounts, which is, in the opinion of the SAFE team, the, the major advantage of account abstraction and what it will bring. And then also finalizing a little bit like, okay, what are the missing topics, more open, undefined topics. So yeah, what is account abstraction? This big question, right? So account abstraction is um, essentially around this that we have responsibilities in our protocol and the Serum protocol, which are around signature verification, replay protection, and gas payment, which are very hard-coded in the consensus layer right now. So signature verification, we have to use ECDSA signatures of a very specific curve, very special to blockchain and not supported on many other devices, actually. Replay protection is also where we say we have, we are very strict, you have an increasing nonce, monotonously increasing nonce, you cannot have transact multiple transactions at the same time. And also for gas payment, it's actually you have to use your native token on Ethereum. There's very little room for alternatives here. And we want to move this to the execution layer and abstract it away from the consensus layer because it allows us to be more flexible here, right? Like we can use other signature schemes. We can um, have support for BLS signatures, use multi-signature schemes. We can have replay um, protection that allows out of order transaction and also have gas payments that are more flexible using tokens, for example, for payment. So the big question is, how do we get there? Before the talk, I looked it up, like, because it's not a new topic, account abstraction, actually. And hey, I'm not sure if I'm correct. It's EIP 86 or something, so very, very, very early EIP from Vitalik, which says, let's do account abstraction. So this was around since the very early days of Ethereum, and it did not happen yet. So doesn't seem to be that simple to solve this. And since this has been going on so long, there were quite some teams that said, okay, let's try to take some initial steps. And one of the steps that has been proposed and has been implemented just recently is this account abstraction via an entry point, so entry point based account abstraction. So if we look at this flow, what we can see actually the left part of the flow, we, it's very standard. You have your owner of an account that signs the transaction, collects it together, and then now it's a little bit different. To, in the normal flow, you hand then these, the signed transaction towards the validators or to a node that then puts it into a block. But how this entry point-based account abstraction works is that you hand it over to bundlers or relayers, and these then submit it towards an entry point. And the entry point is an on-chain component, a smart contract in this case, that um, validates certain conditions and ensures that you can interact with a well-defined interface with your smart contract account that then can implement custom signature schemes, custom replay protection, and can pay the gas tokens however you want. And I mean, that is currently the most well-known standard in account abstraction, at least of this year, and that is ERC-4337, actually. And there's a big advantage to the standard, and this is actually 
we can start utilizing this, start collecting insights into a count abstraction without changing the consensus layer. So we do not require a hard fork like we required for the merge. It's just another contract on top of the chain. This also means that you don't have the full security assumption from all of the validators, but it's a very important big step because we need to collect data. It also gives us an initial rule set for the bundlers. So the bundlers um, are taking some risk because um, when you intake with a smart contract, suddenly this validation of the signatures is a lot more volatile. It might happen that actually the, what you validated before that the signature was valid is not valid anymore, so they have to take some risk, and it actually introduces some denial of service vectors. This was actually one of the main parts why account abstraction didn't happen so far. If you look up past EIPs around this, it was always, what is the risk? What if, how much gas should we limit the verification phase to? How do we ensure that this does not bring down the whole network? And this, again, is where ERC 437 creates some initial rule set. It um, might be quite limiting compared to having just smart contract accounts that you interact with, but it allows us to learn from them. It allows us where are the limitations, where does it, um, where should we try to loosen the restrictions to enable more modularity. Additionally to this, it also introduces some of these concepts they call paymasters. And paymasters are like alternative payments flows. Like the normal flow is the account pays for your gas fees, but actually they are very interesting use cases that go beyond this. Potentially, you do not want to pay in ETH. You would like to pay in DAI or in USDC because it's more native to you to see the fees in a dollar with a dollar connotation. Or maybe some teams want to sponsor the transaction. And this is, in my opinion, one of the big UX needs that we need to get to because if all the users first have to own crypto in their account to start interacting with debts that are non-financial, we will never get the adoption that we um, thrive forward to. And last but not least, the potentially most important thing by 437 is that they define an initial version of an account interface. And this account interface is important because it's, again, when we think about abstracting this away, there needs to be a way how the consensus level, which is represented by the entry point in the first step, interacts with the contracts to verify the signatures and to do the gas payment. And who knows if this interface is a perfect interface or the final interface, but it's our discussion starting point. So this is, again, when, talk, when I was talking about this, I want that as many developers as possible start looking into this, say, okay, where do they see blockers? Where is stuff not working for them? And this is, again, where 437 gives us a very good starting point. But where do we go next? I mean, okay, now we have this entry point account abstraction, entry point based account abstraction, but that's not our end state, right? Like, we want to have this native. And actually, um, I know that the 437 team, they are working together with quite a lot of the layer twos. So the layer twos can act a little bit more dynamic than Ethereum mainnet. They are, have a little bit more freedom. And actually, they could start that we say, hey, the sequencers, we don't need this whole pool of bundlers and relays anymore, but the sequencer starts accepting user operations, so 437. And with this, we're already simplifying this flow quite a lot for the user because they don't have alternative mempools or like proprietary structure that they have to go to. It's the same entry points that they talk for, uh, with to, in general, get information about the, um, uh, about the layer two. Then under the hood, it can still use the on-chain entry point. Um, or even better, they could go towards a way they, where they even cut out this on-chain entry point and say they support very natively fully the flow directly towards the contract and have this on the consensus level. This would be then the ultimate vision also for Ethereum mainnet to go for. Currently, we have some networks or some roll-ups already doing this, like ZK Zinc, also Starknet, where you can start um, evaluating this. But essentially, these are the projects that we need to better understand what are the blockers, what are the limitations, and where do, where do we have to find new solutions to enable the modularity that we want to have. So yeah, now I talked a little bit about account abstraction, that's nice, but I said the power of account abstraction is modular smart contract accounts. So why do we think so? So actually that's one of our default slide by now. Uh, very big thanks to my co colleague co-founder Lucas who created this slide. 
Um, so for us, why the future of smart accounts is modular is because it enables us to have composability, customizability, security, and adaptability. So what does it mean? A lot of text. I try to summarize this a little bit more quickly. And so composability is that actually if you have a, smart, a modular smart account system, actually you can have multiple teams creating different modules for this, and you can have um, reuse this code and build on top of this code more easily. And it's not just one team building one monolithic project. We had a talk earlier on this stage where it was talking about the same concept for Ethereum nodes or Ethereum blockchains in general, right? Like going into a more modular um, future allows us to be more flexible. Also, customizability is important because not every user has the same needs. Currently, the Ethereum landscape is, from the user side is actually quite homogeneous. Like it's, there are some left and right, but it's a lot of crypto native users and people that know a little bit of crypto, it's very little the people that have zero knowledge about crypto, like my parents. And if we really want to get a cater towards them, we need to make sure that they can cover their use cases that they want to project onto the blockchain. Another, for us, actually most important point is security. And this is where if, you, if your core smart contract account, your, uh, your core smart contract of your account, um, has security risk, like this is the biggest problem or the biggest critical attack vector that could happen. So we have to make sure that it's very secure and has, like, doesn't change very often. And there we can see that, again, when we combine it with composability and customizability, it can become tricky if you have to constantly update or change your core contract logic. And this is where a modular logic also allows you to clearly separate the concerns that you have and minimize for specific use cases the complexity, increasing the security. And last but not least, we have adaptability, um, where this is looking into the future. Right? Like we are at a point where um, quantum computers are coming in, we have AI coming in, crypto, like Ethereum and cr the crypto space is evolving forward, and having a way that we can easily adapt towards this future is essential when we really want to capture the next billion users. So yeah, looking at this, we say smart contracts accounts will, will enable a lot of use cases. And even if we look at the safe right now, a lot of people think like the safe is just a multi-sig. But actually, this is just the tip of the iceberg for us. When you look at the safe, um, you can actually, or in general, modular smart contract accounts, you can cover a lot of use cases such as spending policies, as session keys, as roles, general permissions and hierarchies, you can have automation like schedule transactions and even have security features like uh, allow and deny list. And the biggest topic for most of the users, recovery, right? Like all of this is enabled by smart contract accounts and will allow us to build a better UX that basically brings the Web 2 users towards Web 3. So how has SAFE been approaching this actually? And I mean, we have been working on the SAFE modular account framework since 2017. It's basically one of the first steps after, Gnos after the Gnosis ICO was, let's build a smart contract account wallet that can be used by everyone. And this is how we came up with the SAFE account. And actually, the SAFE account as the core, as a primitive, has um, the multi-signature logic, as I mentioned before, but actually you can extend it. You have modules, and modules allow you to define alternative access flows towards your account. This is very useful because you can say, hey, I have this recovery module, and under specific conditions, this is allowed to replace owners because I lost access to the original owners. We also have transaction guards, which allow you to increase the security and protect your execution flow, where you can say, hey, I only allow to interact with very specific addresses. And we additionally have fallback handles. That's a little bit more unintuitive to explain, but I mentioned before adaptability, and actually what we um, saw is that when we created the safe, not all standards that we are used to existed. So actually when we think about NFTs, they have a method that if you want to send an NFT to a smart contract, then the NFT contract calls into the smart contract and asks, hey, do you support that 
NFT. And if you don't react to this call, then you cannot receive this NFT. And these standards are coming up. It was first ERC721, then ERC777, then ERC1155. And to handle all of these new standards, we needed a way to extend our contract to respond to these new callbacks. So this is where we are now. And when there was a question then, OK, why is SAFE not being adopted yet, right? Like it's a smart, modular smart contract account. Everybody, like it seems like the future. Everybody is hyped about this topic right now. And you're around since 2017. Why not? Uh, why did it not happen? And what we saw is that really the three big topics that uh, became for us um, like roadblocks or like stones that stand in our ways were interoperability, discoverability, and security. Since these modules are very powerful and separate contract, we had to find a way how do this in interoperate, right? Like, how do we make sure that the ecosystem can utilize them and build on top of this? And this is quite tricky because since it's um, very core contract features, which is hard to push into the ecosystem. Furthermore, it was very hard that people, the few people that wrote modules, how do they get discovered? How do they, how can we push them into our ecosystem, expose them to our users without compromising on security, since these modules can essentially break your account, like they can drain all the funds or they can lock your account forever. So, okay, where are we at right now? Let's first take a look at interoperability. So this, after 437 was published, actually became, um, there came a huge hype towards smart contract accounts and there was a new push for interoperability, which was very nice for us to see. And one of these standards is ERC 6900, which defines modular smart contract accounts. And on a very simplified level, you can say they define uh, validation um, hooks, or so functions where you can call validation. They have execution functions, which allow you the logic that we, in the slide before, the, um, defined as modules. So um, you can extend what is being executed and how it's being executed. And you have hooks, which are like what we de described as guards before, which allow you to guard your, um, or like hook into your execution flow and add additional checks. Besides this, they also define very high-level plug-in meta information. Right? Like, so you can have a man manifest for a plugin that gives you information about what is it actually doing, what are certain methods that you have, what is the description for it, right? Like, and also allows um, definition of permissions. And permissions are actually very important because if you have such a module, you want to know how does it interact with my account. So this is very cool because if we get the standardized, basically what we can do is we have two different smart contract accounts and they can be completely different standards. But let's say on the left, Alice uses a safe and Bob uses Argent, but they can use the same plugins if all the parties involved follow the standards, which is very powerful because now we have interoperability, we can have tools building on top of these standards and we can then build a thriving ecosystem which can grow and provide the best user experience. So if we recap that a little bit quite quickly, so we have on the left side the accounts where we have ERC 437 um, um, build, uh, working on standards. On the right side, we have modules and these plugins where ERC 6900 is working on. But, you know, that's nice. We now fixed interoperability, but we still have discoverability and most importantly, security left. So. What do we do here, right? Like, because as mentioned before, these modules are super powerful. They can steal all your funds. They can lock all your funds. And this is where we at the SAFE team then came and said, okay, let's put a big picture on it. How do we see this all working together? And this is what we described as a SAFE protocol for us, where we published a white paper and said, okay, let's put it into context. Let's see, uh, let's describe how we see it and how we want to move forward here. And one of the points that we came up with is actually that we, for us really important, we have, I added this little metadata box there, but also more importantly that we have like an intermediate party securing this communication between modules and accounts, which are registries. And registries are very powerful because they provide an abstraction layers that can provide guarantees on supported standards, but they also can provide more ongoing continuous security guarantees if you, for example, connect them to bug bounties that, um, that can act automatically whenever your something comes up. Additionally, they allow you to act like an oracle kind of layer for 
more off-chain validation. Like there is chain security has this process. How can we de um, how can we verify deployments? How can we validate them? And such a registry could provide this information on chain. Um, without the user having to worry about it and can therefore protect this connection between modules and accounts. And last but not least, it can also act as an adapter for existing on-chain services, such as the Ethereum attestation service, which allows you to attest to certain information and providing certain guarantees based on these attestations. But what we can see here is that a lot of this information is actually not meant to be used directly on chain for modular smart contract accounts, especially this deployment validation we see that, um, that it is primarily meant off chain and it's not contract possible, right? And there was, when we talked with our um, like security auditors and how to improve this, one of them actually told us a story where they said, hey, look, we interacted with the client and the client said, please audit our contract. And they did so, they came back with feedback, said this contract needs to get a major overhaul, it's not secure. And the expectation then is normally that, you, that the customer comes back with a revision and they do another audit. But what happened here was the, auditor, uh, the customer said, hey, that's nice, and they used still the same code, published it, put on their website, we got audited, which is true, even though the audit said it's not secure. And then for the user, it was very hard to verify because a normal user doesn't understand security audits and there is no on-chain guarantee. And this is where we also, where another standard that we are also involved in is this ERC 7512, where it's about on-chain audits. Like how can we represent these security audits and the, the security um, reviews on-chain in a way that you can verify the authenticity and also the state of these audits. And most importantly is that we want to have this information parsable in a like for a contract. Because this allows us then, independently on what chain, but that we can take this information, give it to a contract, and utilize it in the contract, and use this as a building block for attestation and registries, for example, to build a reputation system, and also to have automated checks where we say you can only list um, or like you can only connect a module towards an account if it has, uh, if it has such an on-chain representation. So yeah, this, with having this, with enabling these um, registries, we now can cover security and actually also registries are a very essential building stone for discovery because when you have registries, potentially multiple, these are central points where we track a lot of information about these modules in the first place, allowing us to build them better UI and UX for discoverability on top of them. So yeah, as mentioned in the beginning, the whole point of this talk was to engage everybody in these discussions. And I mean, I posted two, the two QR codes again where the safe team is currently involved from, like or the owner of these initiatives, but I have shown plenty other of um, QR codes, and I encourage everyone to visit Ethereum Magicians, post your questions, post your opinions, because only by collecting the feedback we actually are able to really thrive for a good standard that is usable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Are there any questions? I see one here. I get one question. Do we have exactly one question? Does anybody want to take it? Else you can also find me. Or... How do you think the handling of the registry will work? Uh, will there be multiple providers of these registries and I can just pull them in into my, uh, my wallet? Or will the registry be um, like uh, hosted by my wallet provider? That's a very interesting question. I think it depends very much on your use cases, right? Like when we internally discuss this, it always comes around, does the user understand the significance of a registry? In the sense of, if I as a user have to worry about which, registr which registry to use, you're back at the point where you have to understand a little bit what are the inner workings, right? So uh, one of the ways, depending, like if we say we want to have a full retail wallet, for example, or like a retail module, uh, solution that makes use of these modules might be actually that you say there is for these users, for this wallet, exactly one registry. That being said, even so it's only one registry is exposed to the users that might be somehow governed by some tokenomics. 
it doesn't mean that there is in general only one registry, right? Like there are for different purposes, different registries. Um, you might have things which is more tech focused where you can expose more information for these registries or have different security assumptions. I mean, we see it in the normal world. You have, um, you have a nightly channels for a lot of software, right? Like, but you, you have to actively opt into this one to get, the, to get your code from there. So I would assume, like the short answer is there will probably be multiple registries, but I assume some, most of them will not be exposed to the users directly. Thank you, Richard, for all your work and this talk. Give a big round of applause to Richard Meissner.